What's going on? Welcome to ednews.com. I'm your host, EJ Carrion. Today we have Lisa Forbes, Assistant Clinical Professor in Counseling Programs at the School of Education in the University of Colorado, Denver, and David Thomas, Executive Director of Online Programs at University of Denver. Lisa, David, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So I would love to uh, talk about the the playbook um, and what kind of formed the group um, professors at play and kind of what was that spirit and uh, what can people expect from submissions and, 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 and call to actions you guys are looking for? Well, I can start with how the group developed. It was kind of random. <laughs> it was actually during COVID. It wasn't intentional, but it just kind of happened that way. So 2020, June of 2020, um, David and I had been talking about play and learning and fun and learning, and we came across a few people that were doing it, but we didn't know so many people were interested in it. So we started a listserv with five people, um, and then I had a couple of publications that came out, and we mentioned the listserv, and now we have 710 people mm. on professors at play listserv. So we did it just to keep the communication open about play and learning and higher education. And now it's kind of this tidal wave that just keeps developing. Um, so we do play posium, annual play posiums and um, the listserv, obviously people can post ideas and brainstorm together. We have a book club that's starting, that'll be fun. We've got social media uh, website. So it's really taken off, but it's been such a a fun thing to do. Yeah, and you asked about the playbook. Um, so the playbook is is the, the next big adventure we've undertaken. It's a, it's a collection of techniques. And, and let me tell you real quick that um, when Lisa and I look at the, the idea of professors at play, uh, we talk about now the play evolution. This is the theme mm -hmm. of the, the playposium this year. And it's, it's really this transformational power of play to not just change um, a lesson or a course or a curriculum, but really to even just change our pose toward higher ed. And so we have found this big community of people that really want to bring the power of play, which is the power to connect people, the power to kind of unlock thinking, the power to motivate people to learn. I mean, it's really, really big, big thematic things that are important to us. And so, so it gets big, 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 big. And then we realize that most people are like, yeah, but how do I just get my class excited at the beginning of class? Like, don't you have some icebreakers? So we kind of have capitulated over time and, and realized that what people need to kind of get started are techniques. You know, it's almost like we're like, this is like the, the playbook is the hello fresh of cuisine, right? It's just <laughs> some packaged stuff to help you get involved, get your hands dirty and start learning to cook. It won't be the sufficient thing to get you to the play evolution, but it'll help. So the, so the playbook, you know, we've been collecting submissions. Um, we just finished our 2021 play posium. Some really great techniques were presented there. Now they're pouring in towards our Halloween deadline, but our, our trick or treat that we can announce today is the trick is that we're moving the deadline. So the treat is that everyone's gonna have like another month to, to get the techniques in. And let me tell you, I'm, I just would say for myself, I'm super excited about the techniques that are pouring in because they're from all over the place, every kind of discipline, different kinds of stuff. Some are very eccentric kind of outgoing techniques. Some are very kind of thoughtful. And I think there'll be something for everyone in there. So um, if all goes well, we'll be looking to see the, the playbook out sometime on ETC Press next year. Well, that's awesome. And I think... Um... You know, I think you guys also play with the the uh, digital component and, uh, um, and and how that works as well. So with your guys' thoughts around um, digital learning environments, what have you learned of how to integrate play, maybe not just in physical classrooms as people are back, but also in digital environments? I think that was actually one of the reasons that made Professors at Play explode like it did mm. during COVID because... I think some of the people that joined are just naturally playful and kind of align with that philosophy. <clears throat> but I also think a lot of people felt turned upside down when COVID came and forced into this digital teaching world that many hadn't experienced and many didn't want to experience. And here we are. And how do we engage students? How do we um, you know, present this material in a more lively way? Because it's over Zoom and it's more difficult. So. Um, I think a lot of people came for that, looking mm -hmm. for some ideas. And I had very little te online teaching experience at that point. I think David can 
um, say more to his experience, but for me, it was just trial and error and figuring things out and kind of the whole play evolution idea is first, not taking ourselves too seriously, but also doing things differently. And so I think higher education, in my opinion, tends to be doing things over and over and over the same way that we've always done it for years and decades. Um, And so I think COVID was actually a great opportunity for us to do something different because we were forced to. Um, And so I just started playing around with ideas and doing things um, in a playful way because we had to. So that was one of the things that the listserv, I think, blew up about. People would get on and say, you know, how do, how are you supposed to lecture online? Mm-hmm. Let's think of some ideas. Um, I think in yeah, a I sense, think you're a, like a flappy bird expert based off of, yeah. the, based <laughs> right. off of your, uh, your classes. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, what do we do? How do we bring in those digital elements? And in a sense, I think it expanded the possibilities being online because you have things like flappy bird to open a class, you know, the first three minutes. Um, there's, the everybody has a computer right at their fingertips when in a traditional class in person people don't have that so I think that's what helped professors at play grow so I don't know David what you have to add yeah absolutely I mean COVID's been a boon and a bane I mean one thing COVID did is it challenged a lot of professors that really were pretty set in their ways they knew how to teach they knew what they were doing and it forced them to re-engage curriculum for the first time in forever. Mm. And so I think that there's been a renaissance of interest in teaching. Um, and so that was great. And that was an opening for play to be like, hey, I'm looking for new techniques. Um, and, and what Lisa said is absolutely true. You know, before COVID, uh, we were trying to get people off their computers to stop playing on their computers <laughs> and go outside. And now we're like, how do you play on computers? I'm like, guys, play is universal. It's just like, you know play on the computer is different than play in the classroom, but it's play, you know, it starts with you having a playful attitude. It starts with you engaging students and creating these opportunities for, you know, this kind of joyful connection. And, and again, that's what professors at play is about at the end of the day, it's like modeling it, it's showing people, it's developing techniques and doing research to kind of help support this. But at the end of the day, man, no one has to teach you how to play, but sometimes what you really need is just permission to play. So we're all about telling professors you have permission to play. Yeah, how's um how has the um I guess the momentum of it um go from higher ed to to any context out of higher ed into more the K through twelve or high schools uh, implementing some of the tactics that you guys are sharing or getting involved? I don't know specifically um, if what we're doing is impacting um, K through twelve. I I think it would benefit K through 12. Um, When you think about play and learning, you it's usually in childhood because Mm -hmm. play is children's natural language. And so it's just natural to bring that into early childhood education. And I don't think they do it very well either, Mm because I think our culture at large has this idea that play is frivolous and a waste of time and it shouldn't be for serious learning. So I think it's more so in early childhood education, but I think every single form of education, every age that's being educated can benefit from play and learning. I just don't know if we're impacting those ages, mm-hmm. K 12 yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, you can think about, you know, higher ed where you come to grow up, right? Mm-hmm. So it's almost like, like we, we're overly serious. We're unnecessarily serious. And, and, we're serious in a time when people need play. I think about play. I mean, play itself is, is encountering ambiguous, uncertain environments, dealing with them with confidence and bravery, finding resources, building trust with people, tackling the unknown. I mean, wait a minute. Did I describe play or did I describe what the challenge of higher ed is? And mm-hmm. you can kind of see, we see such symmetry and we think that you know, bringing students out of uh, out of high school into higher ed, and then saying, "Stop thinking," you know, we're going to give you the answers. We're in charge. We know what's best. I, I think that that's that that's a very strange old model. Yeah. When really, what we want to do is we want to engage. We want to excite. We want to ignite. We want to develop creative thinking and critical mm-hmm. thinkers. And play does all those things. So you know, yeah, play is good for everybody. It's good for old people. It's good for young people. Lisa and I picked higher ed because that's where we see 
where we can have the influence. And boy, every person we meet, every single person that joins this community is a reminder that it's a shared cause. It's not just some harebrained scheme from a couple of Colorado professors. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you mentioned how the idea and the momentum was focused on getting off screens and moving outside. And then you kind of had to pivot and, and see where uh, people were seeking for how to implement play digitally. What do you see are some of, you know, what is, you know, the importance of play and your expectations of, of what does post higher ed after COVID look like um, for the world? Where do you see this kind of going and playing such a vital role to that transition? I hope it changes higher ed. I hope we don't just go back to the new, to normal, what was before. I hope we create something different, being forced into, you know, doing things differently. And I hope play has a big part of that. I think my personal opinion is that higher education is way too serious. We take ourselves too seriously. We like status quo. We like people conforming to that status quo. Mm. We train students to take exams really well, memorize information, but then they get into the work world and those aren't the skills that are asked of them. And so I think play, like David was just describing earlier, play is the way to create critical thinking skills, to get people more flexible and creative in the way that they do things. So for me, play is like more about creativity and flexibility, not doing things the same old way. So I hope that at post, post COVID, whatever that means, um, mm -hmm. that higher education is more flexible, more creative, more playful, and just not one way fits all. I think lecture is a very common route that people go and it's static and it's boring, I think. There's very few skilled lectures that I know of. Um, so I hope that this is really pushing people outside their comfort zones and then our comfort zone expands at that point and higher education is just more engaging and dynamic. But sometimes I'm skeptical because I think the status quo is so strong that I think a lot of people will just kind of revert back to that. Yeah, but we'll keep fighting the good fight. And EJ, you pointed to something that I, I'd want to kind of address, which is, you know, in, in traditionally we say, oh, don't play on computers, right? We're trying to get kids off computers. A lot of it has to do with the way that a lot of the electronic entertainment is structured so that it's it's you versus a machine, right? It's you talking to a machine. And maybe, maybe there's some people you're playing with. And, and I think that's a mistake to think that, that computers naturally disconnect people. I mean, look at us now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, for us play, one of the very fundamental parts of play is that it connects people. It's why you can show up on an on a, you know, urban basketball court and play a pickup game with people that you don't know who they are, you don't know what their background is, but you can play with them and you can feel that camaraderie and that connection. And so for us, it's like, you know, being able to play online, a play posium, online games, an online course, whatever. It, to us, it's about, as long as the medium is being used to connect people, I don't care if it's computer or the, or the playground. And the reality of it is, I think in our global world, maybe now we got a chance to play with some people that aren't like us. So we're not just on the playground with the same people. We're starting to play with some new people. So I'm excited about the idea of play being a, a medium through which we educate rather than it being like, well, it's computers or it's playgrounds or it's classrooms or it's lecture halls, you know, play is the medium. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I appreciate you guys kind of hopping on on Ed News and, and sharing. And so the professors at Play Playbook, you will extend you're extending contributions for another month. Is that what I heard correctly, David? You got it, yeah. And then, uh, just curious, this is the first volume of this book? Or is, have you guys done it before? No, this will be the, the first and the only. First and, well, <laughs> no, it's it's the first of a 10,000 volume you know, work that we'll produce. I'm sure no, Play I, gets more creative over over time. And so, uh, uh, and, I, and I think absolutely. it's- Absolutely. And I think it's cool to, you know, I think about, it has to be probably a cool group of people all come together if you guys are focused on play. So awesome. Yeah, come join us. <laughs> yeah. Awesome to have a cool community. So I'm going to put the description in the, in the, uh, the, the link in the description. So if you guys have submissions or, or ideas or want to pick up the book when it comes out, uh, you'll be able to see it there. Um, so Lisa, David, thank you so much for being on Ed News and uh, looking forward to the book. Thanks, Thanks for having, for having us. us.